Well, my clock says two o'clock, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, unfortunately, I'm having some issues with my video today, so you're only going to be able to hear my voice and not see me. Um, but I'm just here to quick introduce our speaker. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Katie Stilp. I am the local history librarian here at Appleton Public Library. And for those who aren't familiar with Appleton Public Library, we're located in Wisconsin, just south of Green Bay. Um, this is our Find Your Ancestors series. It's a genealogy series that we do every month online. Um, so thanks for finding us and joining us today. Uh, before we get started, I just have a few quick announcements. First, I just want to thank the friends of the Appleton Public Library for providing support and funding for this program. Um, we wouldn't be able to do it without them. They've allowed us to bring a lot of awesome speakers and we have lots of awesome speakers lined up for the rest of the year. Um, so you can sign up for our future Find Your Ancestors presentations. I do have a little handout link um, that I'm going to post in the chat in just a minute. Or you can visit our events calendar at apl.org slash calendar or check out our Facebook page and see our upcoming Find Your Ancestors programs. Um, for June, we're going to talk about organizing your research, which I think everybody um, can, you know, learn a lot from. And it's always a to-do list on to-do list item on uh, my genealogy is to, to get more organized. Um, in July, we're going to talk about finding your German ancestors in maps and gazetteers. And in August, we're going to host Judy Russell, the legal genealogist, and she's going to talk about researching the family black sheep. Um, if you need any help navigating any of our library databases, or if you have any questions about your genealogy research that you just want another set of eyes, or you know, to find out, you know, what kind of suggestions I might have, feel free to email me. My email is on the screen and it's going to be in the handout as well. I also encourage you to check out our YouTube channel for our past programs. Um, we have some really great ones from Find Your Ancestors as well as like how to research your house history. Um, and just a heads up that April's webinar, which was on UK and Irish roots is coming down in a few days. Um, some of our speakers, you know, they generally allow us to record it. Um, but some just have a, a time limit on when we can post the recording um, just for, you know, their own privacy and, and use of, you know, booking more, more speakings. Um, so if you haven't caught the April webinar yet, definitely check out our YouTube channel um, in the next few days before it comes down. During today's presentation, um, as I said, we're going to have a handout and I'm going to post the link in the chat in just a minute. Uh, we also have a Q&A box, um, so if you have any questions that come up during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box and we'll answer those at the end of the presentation. Also, after the program, we have a short survey. It's just eight questions. Um, it's from Project Outcome, which is a, a library association um, survey, um, just giving us feedback on what you thought of today's presentation. Um, so I'm going to post a link to that towards the end. Um, and there's also a link in the handout if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes just to answer that survey. We'd greatly appreciate it. Um, now I can finally introduce our speaker today. Our speaker today is Diane Woodworth Liebert. She is the current governor of the Wisconsin Society of Mayflower Descendants. She's been doing genealogy since the 1970s and is a BU certified genealogist. She also has a BA in history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So I'm going to turn it on over to Diane. Ah, okay. Hi, <laughs> everyone. Looks like there's quite a few people on here. Um, well, the title of my uh, talk is Why Should I Become a Member of the Mayflower Descendants Society? But I have a lot more different type of information on the Mayflower story that I'm going to tell you about. And next. Can you change it? Okay, uh, there we go. This I, I thought was an interesting picture. Uh, kind of gives you an idea of how everybody lived for that voyage. Uh, particularly, I like this middle one where the families stayed. I just was, wonder, was wondering how 100 people got in there. Uh, okay, next again. First, I'm going to tell you something about the General Society of the Mayflower Descendants. This is a, a picture of their house and the museum, and they also have a library. Um, the Mayflower Descendant Society is a heritage society. You can change the picture now, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the Mayflower Descendant Society is a heritage society established to keep the history and story of the English settlement that arrived on the North American continent in 1620 alive. 
These settlers left us a fancy, fascinating history, a distinctive way to celebrate our Protestant religion, the democratic way of government, and many descendants. Most members join because one, through their fam the family, they have heard that they are, uh, are an uh, have an ancestor that came over on the Mayflower. Uh, what were they? And they want to prove it. Two, another member of their family, an extended family is a member and they want to celebrate the family connection. Or three, like me, after I had spent all that time doing the research, I wanted it verified. To preserve our history, the General Society, which was established in 1897 in Plymouth, Massachusetts, has obtained some of the real estate in Plymouth, Massachusetts area. We have a library, museum, we just purchased a church, which is a picture of here. Um, we purchased it, that's replacing actually one of the original churches. Uh, it also houses a cemetery called Burial Hall. And some of the family members are interred there. And this other plaque is actually a picture of the, um, the people who came over on the, bo on the boat but died in the first winter. Uh, next, okay, thank you. I have to do it. The Mayflower Society offers research, education, and genealogy of Mayflower related families. And this is another view of the uh, house and the, the, the property. And this is the inside of the library. Okay. okay. Our Wisconsin Society was established in 1901. We are one of 53 member societies. Our society holds an annual meeting in November. This year, so far it will be on November 6th, providing uh, we can all get in there. Uh, we didn't have it last year because of the pandemic. Uh, and what we do is honor our ancestors and also use it as our general meeting to handle any issues that, the, that require member approval. We also hold a summer activity this summer, we're planning on meeting it over in Wisconsin in the end of July. I don't know the exact date yet. The general ambiance within the group is relaxed. We all feel like we are related. Most of us are cousins at some level. I have 15 Mayflower ancestors, so I'm related to most of the members. If you are interested in joining, the number one requirement, of course, is to be descended from one of the Mayflower voyagers that arrived in Plymouth on the Mayflower in 1620. If you have a family member who has already joined, your research is really not too complicated. All you need to do is contact the historian from your, the local, your local society. The historian, who is a volunteer, will get you started. The first information he or she will need is the name and any other information that you're on your uh, relative's applications. We, she can apply to the General Society and get a copy of that application and then guide you from there. And all you really need to prove is your connection between the person and you. If you think you may qualify, again, contact the historian of your local society. In this case, you will need to start with yourself and go from there. When I started, I uh, kind of split my grandparents up into four volumes. And it's only one of the grandparents' lines that I'm a uh, descendant through. But you kind of have to do that to match the names. Um, with the internet, it's a whole lot easier than in the past. But again, the society histori historian will help. Now, for more information, um, our website can be found at wimayflowersociety.wordpress.com. You can find us on Facebook at Wisconsin Mayflower Society Descendants or email our historian at historian.mayflower at gmail.com. Our annual dues are $45 a year. To apply and join, it costs $195. The 150 pays for the research verification that is done both at the state and the general society level. And if it proves that you don't qualify, then you get the, uh, the your $45 back. Now, this section of um, this talk is about 
uh, what happened before the Mayflower even got near uh, Plymouth. And I started calling this the Money Men. Anyone, everyone is taught that the Pilgrims were the first English people to settle in America. The Puritans were not far behind, but most of the time they are confused as both groups arrived from England for ostensibly religious reasons. The only truth here is that they both arrived from England, but they were separate religious groups. With the reign uh, change to King James I in 1603, many of the Protestant groups were scared of Britain reverting back to Catholicism. The Pilgrims uh, wanted to completely separate from the Church of England and the Puritans only wanted to reform it. However, they were all financed by the same group of, of investors. These investors were mostly wealthy businessmen who wanted to profit from the goodies that their southern neighbors were bringing over from the Americas and profit was their motive. I have a list of uh, some of them, I think probably most of them on here that I could find. I think there's a couple of others that I, I'm aware of that aren't on this list. But I thought it was kind of interesting to see how many people really were in, involved in investing on these settlements. Uh, also, the truth is that before 1620 in Virginia, three different settlements were attempted by Sir Walter Raleigh during Queen Elizabeth I's reign. She, was, she reigned from what, 1558 to 1603. Several settlements were attempted, but they never took hold. One of the reasons was that they only sent men. Here's a picture of the uh, of Roanoke Island, where it is, where it was located. Yeah. Okay, next page. The first one was in 1587 on Roanoke Island, now in North Carolina. This was the settlement where everyone disappeared. One story I heard when I visited the area many years ago was that in order to get enough financing for the project, many heads of the upper class families sent their second sons. These sons were in the Prince Harry situation. They were along with their, they were raised along with their older brothers, but didn't inherit the prize. Ergo, they normally would enter the armed services. In these cases, these boys or young men were sent to what was then known as the Virginia area. These men did not know how to care for themselves or how to survive in the wild. They had their personal servants with them, and even though the servants knew how to care for their patron, they didn't know anything how to survive in the wild country either. Many of the servants decided that by joining the local Indian tribes, they have better lives than being uh, bossed around by these spoiled young men and dying anyway. Okay. Two more settlements were set up under the auspices of the Virginia Company, with Sir Walter Raleigh still involved. The investors finally figured out that at least you needed some women there to do what women do. There is a book out entitled The, the Jamestown Brides by Jennifer Potter about the single women who were sent to Jamestown to find husbands and a list of the things slash jobs that the women would bring with them. There's also a very interesting article in the uh, August 31st, 2016 edition of the Atlantic Magazine called Mail Order Brides of Jamestown, Virginia. Uh, I found that on the internet. It's a, if you're interested in this at all, this is a really uh, interesting uh, article and well, re, re, well re, uh, researched. That's by Marsha Zug. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time the Mayflower settlers arrived in New England in 1620, several Indians had been kidnapped and sent to Europe and put on public display. Here's an example of Pocahontas in her uh, costume, I guess. Um, and put on public display. An example is of Pocahontas and our savior Squanto. The British referred to them as savages. When the Mayflower voyagers arrived at the land, they discovered land that had been cultivated and with, I think even some grown, uh, growing. This was mostly Wampanoag land and eventually they found out that the entire tribe had been killed off. Squanto was the only tribal member left and he survived because he'd been had been kidnapped and was in Europe when the event took place. He became a very helpful member of the settlers uh, group 
because he had also learned to speak English. Evidently, the Northern European fishermen had killed off the tribe by giving them blankets that were infected with smallpox. Although now the scientists are suggesting there may have been another cause, but who knows if they'll ever be able to prove that. Meanwhile, in 1607, France arrived in Canada and proceeded to set up a very lucrative beaver pelt business with the Northwestern Indian tribes and marrying with them to create stability. I'm sure you're all aware of Marquette and Joliet. Now I'm gonna get into some of the problems that the separatists had trying to keep their, keep their religion going. This is uh, while they got trying to get out to the ship that was going to take them to Holland. This is one of their... For the separatists, setting up a new life in a wilderness country was not as harrowing an experience as their attempt to leave England. England at this time had just lost Queen Elizabeth I, who was comfortably Protestant. And even though King James I, her successor, was raised Protestant. He was the son of Mary Queen of Scots, and he followed the Church of England rituals religiously. Also, he wasn't tolerant of any other religious thought or ideas that differed. Many of the rituals of the Church of England were also practiced by the Catholics. Therefore, any church that worshiped anything different was watched with suspicion by the Archbishop of the area. In America, we refer to the Church of England as Episcopalian. Here's a picture of Scrooby Manor. William Brewster, one of the leaders of the separatists, as a teenager, was studying at Cambridge University and hooked up other theological students where they discussed ways to reform the church. It was from these discussions that the separatist movement was created. William was the son of a man who had served as sheriff and postmaster for the Scooby area and had political connections. Sometime after William left Cambridge, he was hired as clerk for William Davison, who served as Secretary of State and was on the Privy Council under Queen Elizabeth I's reign. Unfortunately, as a member of the Privy Council, Davison became involved with the Queen Mary of Scots events. And even though Queen Mary I, or Queen Elizabeth I, had signed the warrant for Mary's execution, her conscience evidently bothered her and she blamed Davison for the decision. With Davidson's downfall, so went Williams. This information I copied from Mary B. Sherwood's book, Pilgrim, a biography of William Brewster. This again is another, uh, another picture of the uh, Scrooby Manor. William then returned to Scrooby and replaced his father as postmaster. It was at Scrooby Manor where the separatist movement really took off. The members would meet there, and when their meetings were noticed by the neighborhood authorities, they started meeting at different members' homes. By 1607, events were getting so dire that the group began to feel threatened and decided it would be safer for them to secretly escape from England than remain there, so they started making plans. At this point, the Dutch were welcoming uh, Protestant beliefs from, every beliefs from every forum, so they decided to go there. They sold as many of their possessions and real estate as they could, hired a ship to rendezvous at a secluded area, and were on their way. The women and children traveled by small boats while the men walked the 60 miles to the shore. They met the boat and all embarked. At that point, the captain of the ship signaled the authorities and every one of them were arrested. Now the authorities in Boston, Lincolnshire, the nearest town, had a problem. You can arrest all of the men, but what do you do with all these women and children? The court finally told them to go home, but the problem for them was that they had given up their home and old life. Eventually, the family found places to stay. The men were released with the exception of Brewster and a couple of the other leaders. William Brewster in his spare time had started printing out pamphlets espousing the separatist belief and started to circulate them. Uh, this is another picture of them trying to get offshore, getting offshore. This setback did not deter the group from their quest. They hired another ship 
This time the captain was Dutch and again arranged to meet him at a secluded shore. To get to the ship, the passengers had to go in small boats and small groups. After a couple of loads of passengers were on board, the captain noticed the authorities were coming towards them. He decided in order to protect his ship and crew, he needed to set sail immediately. This he did with whomever was aboard, again leaving most of the women and children behind. The trip across the North Sea took about 14 days because of the weather, then, but they all arrived in Amsterdam intact. And slowly, in small groups, the rest of the separatists were able to join them. In the meantime, the Protestant groups who were living in Amsterdam were starting to disagree on issues and were splintering. Brewster, along with the other leaders, decided to move somewhere else. The authorities in Leiden agreed to let them settle there. And this is a of depiction of a uh, picture, actually, of, of Leiden that was drawn in uh, 1572 by a Franz Hardenberg. It was as close as I could get to, uh, to what it looked like at that time. Now, we'll discuss a little bit of their life in Leiden. This picture up here is, of course, a typical Dutch picture. This walkway is actually the entrance to the housing where Brewster and his family and some of the other family members lived. And this building is actually the American um, Museum that uh, is there. And if you ever get to Leiden and you're interested in, it's really a nice little uh, museum, and he's got lots of interesting stuff that the uh, writing people use, the Mayflower people use when they were living there. This museum, which was established in Leiden, displayed Mayflower artifact, uh, artifacts by Jeremy, ba Jeremy Bangs, who was living there and was concerned that the separatist his history would be forgotten. I'm showing you this picture of this uh, display because it still amazes me. This particular display is a repl replica of a family bed. When I questioned the size, Jeremy said that it was regular size. The people in those days slept sitting up, which under it was explained somehow how they could fit into that Mayflower. It appears that they didn't know how much about their bodies and they didn't want any of the bad stuff that came out of the bottom coming out while they were sleeping. For the next 10 years or so, life became routine for the group. Couples married, children were born, and they were allowed to worship however they chose. But in many ways, they were ostracized. They could only get menial jobs. Most all of them lived in clustered housing and were having trouble financially. To add to the abuse, James Chilton, the oldest pilgrim, was hit on the head by a rock thrown by some boys. During that time, Brewster and some of the others continued to print out the pamphlets advertising their views and getting them passed around England. There was a warrant out for his arrest in England, therefore he had to lay low during the, uh, during the plans and everything for the, uh, the venture to uh, North America. Finally, around 1619, they decided it was time to move on. One of their issues was that their children were losing their British heritage and becoming culturally Dutch. The next one. The Mayflower and the Speedwell starting their journey. Many of the members had family connect connections living in Britain and with other uh, acquaintances who enabled them to connect with the London investors and continue with their plans. Uh, however, as in the past, some glitches occurred. First, they purchased a boat named the Speedwell. They planned to keep her in America. Once they started to sail, they discovered a leak and had to abandon her. This caused several of the original families to have to wait for another ship to take them across the ocean, as the Mayflower, which they had rented, was over full with passengers. Also, they had a royal de deed to settle in Northern Virginia, but because of the stormy weather, docked in Cape Cod, on Cape Cod in Massachusetts instead. The fact that they didn't have legal authority to settle in Massachusetts was an issue that bothered the governing council and the cause, and the cause for the Mayflower contract. The issue was satisfied a few years later. To my knowledge, the royal government never paid a cent for any of the property that they were allowing to be settled. The investors or money men 
now referred to as the merchant investors, were more concerned with recouping their money than any religious settlements and added outsiders to the group. Probably the most notorious investor was Thomas Weston. Thomas met up with the separatists while they were in Leiden. His business was instrumental in passing out Brewster's pamphlets in London. He also helped finance some of the settlement trips. However, Thomas was not happy with uh, the speed of any of the returns that were slow in arriving back to England. And in 1622, he tried to establish his own settlement in the area, in the area, planning on the separatists helping his group. Like the earlier settlements, he only sent men. These men, who did not know how to live in the wild, were rowdy troublemakers and refused to live within the pilgrim lifestyle parameters. Before long, the government council kicked them out of the settlement. They then started stealing food from the Indian tribes and almost started a war with them. At which point, the general council put those that had survived on boats and sent them back to England. Thomas Weston was not a popular person and managed to get himself kicked out of England, New England, and Virginia. He ended up settling Maryland for a while, eventually made it back to England where he died of the plague. It was written that Thomas was eager to reap quick profits from the New World and not very scrupulous about it. One of the most notorious actions, in my opinion, was the addition of the four more children. Their legal father, upon discovering that they were not his biological children, uh, excuse me, sued their mother for a divorce in adultery, took custody of the children, and paid Thomas Weston to add them to the group as indentured servants. The children spanned the ages from 10 to 4 and the oldest, Richard Moore, was the only one to live, survive to adult, adulthood. They all, also added persons with specific skills. For example, William Mullins, who was a shoemaker and the father of Priscilla, later wife of, Jane, of John Alden, along with his wife and son, died the first winter, leaving 16-year-old Priscilla with 21 dozen pairs of shoes and 31 pairs of boots. They were to be kept by the governing council until 1627, when she was to be paid for them. Stephen Hopkins, of the trip to Jamestown, who ship crashed in Bermuda thing, was invited to join the group because he was an experienced ocean traveler and had been to the Americas. Miles Sanders joined because he had fighting experience. He had served in the Dutch army. Oops. Here we go. A set of brothers, William and, and Edward Hilton, who were supposed to travel with the first group, stayed behind when they had trouble with the Speedwell and joined the second boat, the Fortune, which arrived in Plymouth in 1621. Uh, they came from, they came, uh, from uh, Hilt, the Hilton family, and they came from a family of salt manufacturers who owned a fishing fleet. William stayed in Plymouth until he got tangled with a minister that the Pilgrim Council didn't approve of and moved on to what is now New Hampshire, where besides being involved in his family's business, settled into another settlement that Sir Fernando Vargas and his son Robert were trying to establish in the main area. Most of the settlers on the original Mayflower voyage had a role to play. Even though there were hiccups in the program, as a group, they made it all work. And finally, on September 1620, the Mayflower set sail to America, and the rest is history. All right, well, thank you, Diane. Now I'm going to take over and tell you a little bit about how you find your own Mayflower ancestry. I found mine quite accidentally. I remembered somehow that my grandmother had told me that my grandfather's family moved to Pennsylvania from Nova Scotia. And somehow the city uh, Yarmouth stuck in my head. And so when I started this, um, I wrote to the historical society there and said, you know, my name is Diane Woodworth and this is what, what I know. And they wrote back and said, if you give us the line of your family from the time they went, they went left Nova Scotia, we'll send you everything you need to know about getting on the, about the Mayflower. And I was amazed. Uh, but this got me really into the history of Nova Scotia. 
and um, so that's that's how I discovered mine. But it also was the ex beginning of a very expansive family. Are there any other questions? I think there. Uh, there are, but I'm going to talk quick about um, some resources um, that people can use to find their Mayflower ancestors. Since now with the invention of the internet, it's a lot easier. Um, there's a lot of really great websites out there, including the General Society of Mayflower Descendants website. Um, you'll see in the handout, as well as on the screen, um, they have on the Mayflower site um, a list of all the eligible pilgrims. So um, I would definitely take a look at that list first and see, do you recognize any of the surnames um, that might be related to your family somehow? Uh, they also have a listing of some notable descendants of Mayflower passengers, which could be your cousins. So a lot of like presidents, writers, celebrities. Um, it's kind of cool to see who you can find that you're related to. Um, the Mayflower also has a lineage match form um, that's $75. You don't need to be a member of the Mayflower Society, um, but you kind of fill out your, your generations of, of your family line and they look in their databases and they see if they have anybody related to those lines to see if you might be related to a Mayflower ancestor. Um, on the Mayflower site, you can also purchase copies of what are called the silver books. If you are interested in earning, um, owning them, um, and you might be asking, what are the silver books? Um, so the silver books are volumes that document each of the Mayflower passengers through the first five generations of the descent. Um, so they start with the Mayflower passenger. Uh, in the photo example, it's Miles Standish. So it starts with him, and then it lists his children, his wife, um, all of their you know, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, etc., cetera, um, all through the first five generations. Um, so it's easy for you to kind of look at that fifth generation and try to compare it to your family tree and see, um, you know, where there might be a connection. And they're can obviously I, called silver books because they're silver. Can I say, can I say something about the silver books? We have donated silver books to many of the live, local libraries. Yes. And you can find them there. Obviously, the Wisconsin Historical Society has them. But also, if you are a member of the... Um, New England Historical Society. Uh, you have to be a member, however, but they have um, have them on their on their site. You can get the information from there. Uh, there's they're easy to find if you are really looking for them. Uh, but you don't have to really buy them. Um, a lot of times, uh, what comes up on, on Facebook is I, I remember such and such a family. Does anybody have the uh, silver book for that family? And then they will look up and uh, they can look up for the name and, uh, uh, and for you and send you what information you're asking for if they're, if they're willing, but probably most people are. And I know um, they also have silver books that are kind of in the making and they call them the Mayflower Families in Progress and they, they're pink papers. Um, so that includes new information that's newly been discovered and is being researched. And then once it becomes complete, it becomes a silver book. Um, you can look at the Mayflower Society shop to see what kind of silver books are available. And as um, Diane said, there is a lot of libraries in Wisconsin that have silver books. I know there's people joining us from outside of state, um, but you can easily do a search of some of the libraries um, near you live to see where might be the silver books. Um, so there are 16 libraries in the state of Wisconsin. You can see on the map kind of where they're laid out and, and what names of the libraries are where you can go there and look at their silver books and see those first five generations. Or contact the historian at the Wisconsin at our, our uh, society because they've got a lot of information and can help out with a lot of the lot of the stuff. And then um, you might be asking, okay, you have up to five generations. How do you get past that fifth generation? Um, so ideally, if you're looking past generation five, you want to present a vital record for every event um, for each person from that sixth generation on to you. Um, obviously, that's a little difficult, you know, generation six, seven, eight, nine. Um, but usually once you get to that 10th generation, you usually have the av availability of our more modern vital records uh, because states started, you know, making those required instead of just optional. Um, but given record availability, um, this isn't always possible, of course, in those earlier generations. Um, so there are some substitutes that the Mayflower Society does permit. Um, they include like Bible records, census records, cemetery, probate, 
deeds, um, possibly military pensions, obituaries, local histories, and DNA. Um, there is a guide link in your handout for American ancestors on um, how to research your Mayflower ancestor that provides a little bit more information. And you can also ask the Mayflower Society on acceptable forms of proof. Uh, there's also a really great database um, from American Ancestors that's the uh, Mayflower Family's Fifth Generation Descendants 1700 to 1880 database. It has more than half a million names and you can search it for free, um, but in order to view the results and view the information, you have to be a member of American Ancestors, unfortunately. Um, and this is kind of what the, the search form looks like. So Sephora K, she's one of my ancestors who is a descendant of Richard Warren, which was um, one of the Mayflower passengers. Um, American Ancestors also has a really great database on some of the membership applications from the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. So again, you can kind of search for cousins and find people who may already have applied for the society that you really just need to prove your relationship to that person who has already applied and been accepted into the society. And that's another database on American ancestors that you can search. Um, but in order to view the results, you have to be a member of that site. Uh, there are a lot of journals, um, including some scholarly journals on the Mayflower um, descendants and ancestors. Um, so there's the Mayflower descendant, which um, goes all the way back to 1899. Um, and it's related to the Mayflower and their related families. You can find past volumes of that on AmericanAncestors.org, and you can subscribe to get new issues. Um, there's also a couple other journals, the, the American Genealogist, um, Mayflower Quarterly, The Genealogist, and The Register. There's also a lot of books on Mayflower descendants um, and Mayflower sources of, of information, um, like Susan Roser's book on Mayflower births and deaths. Um, it has a lot of vital record information um, into those sixth, seventh, and eighth generations to kind of make that connection between the fifth generation and some of the more um, recent generations that you might have researched up to a point. And I definitely encourage you to contact your local libraries and look for any Mayflower related history books or genealogy books um, to learn a little bit more about the Mayflower and your ancestors. Uh, also in your handout are some uh, listings of the Ancestry.com collections related to the Mayflower, um, as well as some links to some digitized books on Hathi Trust, um, where you can look and see some of that information on, um, on the Mayflower. Um, you can also um, check other state vital record collections based on where your family lived. So for example, if you know your family lived in Massachusetts, they have a book called vital records to 1850. And that might be the connection where you make between the furthest ancestor you have back and then you find out the parents of that person and it's a Mayflower descendant. And then you can continue on the line with the silver books. Um, of course, if you can't find any vital record information, definitely explore church records where your ancestor might live. And again, check to see what, what collections might be available that have already been published in some of the historical society journals or our databases online that have been digitized or are available to search. Um, there's also several Facebook uh, groups dedicated to Mayflower genealogy. So it's really fun to join those and connect with cousins and explore you know, how they might have um, been able to prove their Mayflower line and, and what suggestions they might have for you. So now we are at our Q&A point. So stop sharing my screen and take a look at some of the questions we have. Um, somebody's wondering if they do interlibrary loan of the silver books. I don't believe they do. Um, are you aware of that, Diane? What was the question? I... If they do interlibrary loan of the, the silver books? I, I really don't know. Um, if they might, I would ask. Because some of the libraries, we're even considering not updating the groups anymore because some of the libraries say nobody's using them and they're putting them in the archives down in the basement someplace. So I really don't know. Um, I did all of my research in the Historical Society Library in Madison here, and they had all of them at that time. But again, that was in the 1970s, before the internet. So, but it's certainly worth a try. It's certainly worth uh, asking. You might find, you know, somebody that just wants to get rid of that particular volume someplace and you know, pick it up that way. Yeah, 
Uh, I'm going to guess that they probably don't interloan them just because um, they only have that one copy of it. So they won't let people check them out. So they probably won't send them to other libraries. Um, but definitely look and see if you can find somebody who has a copy if you're not near a library that has copies of them and see if you can um, borrow somebody's copy or, or get somebody to look up some information for you. Someone is asking, um, she said, I read the society requires documentation of all descendants and spouses. If a spouse cannot be identified um, from the 1700s, is there any point in trying to apply? Now, what, I, I'm having trouble hearing, uh, understanding that. Okay, I, to say it again. Um, so the society requires documentation of the descendants and the spouses, but this person cannot um, get any documentation of the spouse. So should she bother applying to the society if she doesn't have that documentation? There must be some way of getting the, the documentation, if it's a fact. Uh, you just have to keep looking. I mean, I found one of my, whatever, grandfather's, um, wills in the back of a, of a file drawer in the small little, uh, you know, vital records office in Northern New York. You know, there's something there. Somebody knows something. Um, I wouldn't give up. I would just keep, keep working at it. And if nothing else, even advertise on uh, some of those uh, sites, particularly Facebook. So a lot of people say, I think I'm a descendant from so-and-so. Is anybody else descended that I could talk to? That kind of thing. And DNA. Uh, DNA is not primary proof, but it's secondary. And it does help you um, kind of steer in the right direction. Because one of the biggest problems with uh, uh, this research is that uh, even on Ancestry and on all of them, there are mistakes. And like, if you have somebody like the name of Mary Lee, there are a hundred million of them. And there were women, women we don't have as good records for. And um, so, you know, sometimes you just kind of have to keep pursuing it. But I would, yeah, I would keep pursuing it. I did. Yeah, maybe check 15 with years. the historian in the state that you're looking at applying for and see, um, you know, what suggestions they might have too. Yeah, yeah. And also like uh, all, the rec all the records, uh, some of the states, uh, prior to uh, 1906 i think is when the federal government required the states to keep all vital records but prior to that some did some didn't um and then also the big another big problem is that as the areas got populated they got they got their own county and so the records up until the time of the change are in the old county and then uh up to that at that point around the new county so you have to kind of you have to learn the geography of the area, and um, as I said, I, I enjoy research, and I had a great time with it. Our next question is somebody, um, they live in Minnesota, and they're wondering if they can join the Wisconsin chapter, or do you, can you only join the chapter where you live? No, she can join the, she can join the uh, Wisconsin one. Um, somebody just said, um, her local library said that Family Search has all the silver books online digitally and available to view for free. I'm not sure of that. I haven't seen that yet. Uh, I've heard that too. I don't know. I haven't tried to find it, but uh, it may. But Family Search, you got to be careful with too, because uh, unless I, unless I actually see the page that the I, the thing is written on. I have to, I check someplace else to make sure it's correct. And then um, somebody asked, how specific do references need to be um, when you're proving th that documentation? They're as specific as you can. It should be so that somebody else can go back and see that, that information. So for instance, is the birth certificate, birth certificates are primary, are primary uh, thing, but the birth certificate in such and such a place, you know, of such and such a person. And, get a photocopy of it or something. Death certificates are not primary because somebody else is giving the information to the uh, the officer who, who writes it down. And those are used sometimes uh, a lot to prove um, where people lived, the dates of when they died, but sometimes they have, yeah, I found one with the wrong name on it. 
and that kind of thing, and that happens. And so you gotta be very careful. But as specific as you can, because the historians are gonna go through this and try to verify the information and contact you and say, okay, this birth certificate or this death certificate isn't right. You have to get it so someplace else, and you need an the marriage certificate. And since uh, since the internet opened up, it's been um, much easier to find this kind of information. But I won't take anything if even from ancestry, if it's not scanned, I got to find someplace else to find the information. Somebody's wondering: Do you send in copies of the documents, or just like a, a citation of it? Uh, we prefer a, a copy of it. Um, you can use e just email, a, you know, scan it or something and email it. If not, you can just say, that, or I've got it or something. And the, whoever's doing the investigating will figure out whether they need to see it or not. And someone made a comment, um, strongly advising people to avoid using online family trees um, because they aren't properly sourced. You know, a lot of those people that try to connect to the Mayflower may not have, have found proof of it. Um, so just be sure to verify everything you find, even if you find it in some of those Mayflower databases, follow up and find the actual records. Yeah, just try to get as close as you can. And um, sometimes there is, uh, you know, someplace else and you just haven't, haven't found it yet. Or it might be that somebody else has that connection and you can prove it that way too. I mean, there's just a lot of ways to do it. It just takes time and patience and persistence. And someone's wondering if you have a sample application that they can see, or is there some way where they can see what the application looks like? Um, actually, if you go on, um, I'm trying to think. I, I'm pretty sure uh, the website, um, I'm pretty sure our website would. If not, yeah, it can be sent. It can be sent to you. What we want first, there's a, a like an app, piece of paper, and we want the names of everybody that you know, and then that gets transformed into a, a formal um, application, and then you know, so it, it's kind of a, a, a process. And I think I'm not sure now. The reason I'm hemming and hawing is because when I did it, it was all out by uh, done by hand. It was a long form. Now that the, uh, the general society is becoming more technically uh, knowledgeable. They're making things easier, and um, uh, they're making it, it easier. And I, I think they're probably a little looser about that. But the best thing is if you've got like a birth certificate, or you can contact the state vital records or whatever, and you have to pay for it. But they will uh, they will send it to you. Uh, also, I worked in Dane County Registered Deeds for a few years, and there, uh, they also take the birth certificates and put them at the county level. And they have books where all of this is written down or where copies of these birth certificates are that you can research. And sometimes that's um, easy to take a picture of it there. I mean, it just depends on each vital records area is run differently, things cost different, uh, and you just kind of have to go and feel your way around it find out. Next question, um, someone changed their name when they were a teen and her birth certificate doesn't match. Um, how would you handle that situation? Um, at that particular case, I would match uh, siblings' names, um, try to uh, match birth, birth records, siblings' names, that kind of thing. Um, I'm just trying to find out, I mean, if they, if they change the name legally, there should be a record, at least in this country. If they came over from Germany, a lot of people changed their names when they came over from Germany. And that's a little trickier, but at some point, somebody might have mentioned it someplace. Um, I know in my second husband's family, their uh, real name is, well, last name is spelled L-I-B-E-R-T, but one of the brothers uh, the family got mad at the rest of the family and it became L-E-I-B-E-R-T. Um, it was easy enough to kind of figure out because Liber is not a real common name. But when you get into Smiths and Jones, you have a few problems. But again, it's just persistent. Someplace somebody knows something. 
Definitely. And um, someone wrote in the chat that there are separate societies for some of the passengers, um, like the William Bradford Society, there's one, um, or the John Howland Society. So if you know of your specific um, Mayflower ancestor, definitely just Google and see if there's a specific society or website with, with that Mayflower ancestor. A lot of, yeah, a lot of, the, lot of the families do have websites. And um, they also have you know, societies that you can join. Uh, there's a question here about a fuller. I have, I, one of mine is a fuller. <laughs> but um, Samuel Fuller, there were two fullers. Is there a, a fuller society that you're aware of? I, I thought at some point somebody had said something about a Samuel Fuller. The, the problem with the fullers is that Edward Fuller and Samuel Fuller came over together. Samuel Fuller didn't have any children at that point, but Edward had a son named Samuel. Then Edward died, and Samuel kind of adopted or raised the other Samuel. And in the process, I think he had a Samuel too. So he got a lot of Samuels, but only, yeah, you know, but most of them were born in this country at that point. So, but you just kind of have to follow the, follow the root lines. And always check Facebook. I mean, there's lots of Facebook groups um, dedicated to specific Mayflower ancestors, Mayflower families as well. Mm -hmm. Um, someone's asking, what do you do if you have conflicting dates? Um, for example, a birth certificate says June 5th, the church record says June 6th, and family Bible says June 4th, but the year is all the same. So do you send copies of all three of those documents, or what do you do? Oh, you could do that. You could pick one, being that they're that close. Um, it really doesn't matter a lot. If there's a census record, that might help. Although census records could be wrong too. If there's a brother or sister that were born too close to them, you can figure that way out. Um, it's just a matter of, of figuring it out. But actually, the, if it's the first, second, and third, it really, they were born in the beginning of June, and that's what's important. Yeah, I, I think the, they're more key on proving that, that line of, of who the parents are um, instead of the exact birth date. Um, so I, I wouldn't worry about that too much either, I don't think. Yeah, that would be, yeah, that's just, uh, I, I don't know, it just kind of depends. Well, those appear to be all the questions we had. Um, if there's any last minute questions, now's your chance. But thank you so much, Diane. I, I really appreciate um, you taking the time to educate us a little bit more about the Mayflower Society and the Mayflower's journey to America. Oh God, I'm hoping you know some of the history. I, I'm a big picture person and I like the history. <laughs> so I'm hoping that that was informative for some people. Um, is there a society for fortune, fortune passengers? Not that I'm aware of. Um, most of the people that came out of the fortune were like uh, like the, the Hilton brothers who missed the other. And actually I am a Hilton and um, I'm sure there's a society for them, but they were my line came from Nova Scotia. Um, the uh, Fortune people, I th there are lists of where, who they were, but a lot of times that was the wives of the children that were left behind. And they had come to join families. And Warren, I think uh, Richard Warren came over, but the, the wife didn't come over until the Fortune. And um, that kind of thing. So it's it's. Not really the society. They mostly were connected somehow to the people that were already there. And then um, someone's wondering if you're related to more than one, how do you decide which line to apply for? Doesn't matter. Because what you do is um, pick one, apply for that, and then you apply for supplements. And um, they're you know, they're put under the same. Uh, they were put on the same uh, under the same number and everything. It's all, your file is under a certain number and that's it. And no matter how many supplements you have, they're all under the same number. But they're, you know, you don't, you, all you have to do is uh, somehow connect them with each other. And uh, in my case, it wasn't really very hard because they all intermarried again when they got to Nova Scotia. <laughs> so for the most part, it was not, a, uh, not an issue. I just had cousins marrying cousins a lot. 
appears to be all the questions we had. So thank you again, Diane. We really appreciate your time and your knowledge. Um, if people want to add any more questions, they can email me at uh, dwliebert um, at gmail.com. I just or put your um, email address there in the chat for people who are, are interested. Okay, yeah, you've got the right to, uh, yeah. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us. I hope again um, that you learned something useful and you have good luck finding your Mayflower ancestors. And I hope to see you all next month. Um, June 12th is our next Find Your Ancestors program where we're going to be talking about organizing your genealogy research. So I hope to see you then. Everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.